promise next year I will have more time to attend. That. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Yves. Thank you. Um, now, ladies and gentlemen, let us have a step into the basics of imaging anatomy and major variants of solid abdominal organs. What uh, we will do, firstly, we I would like to thank my colleagues who provided imaging and graphics uh, to my talk. And the learning objectives are the review of the anatomy and variants of solid abdominal organs with supporting clinical cases. And I would like to concentrate on imaging and images because 40 minutes are quite a long time and I think this is more enjoyable and more fruitful for you. Liver, gallbladder, and biliary tree, pancreas, and spleen are the spectrum of that what we want to see. Let's start with the liver anatomy. The liver provides two surfaces for us, the diaphragmatic surface and the peritoneal surface. The liver is uh, mostly covered by costal cartilages and all of you who are doing sonography know that that um, gives us some difficulties to see the whole liver. The liver is closed uh, to many organs, firstly from the diaphragmatic um, part to the thorax, but closed to abdominal organs, to the stomach. As you can see on this sonographic image, there is a very close relationship. The gallbladder, the right colon, kidney, and adrenal gland. Uh, the size of the liver has to be seen uh, in different navigation systems. In CT, we uh, have 12 centimeter graniocaudal extension and 20 from lateral to lateral. But in countries uh, who refer to good nutrition, we should be not uh, that strict with the 12 centimeters. The segmental anatomy now is done for many years, let's say decades, with the Quino system where, um, where we have the, um, the division through the parts of the segments uh, by the liver veins and as well from the gra uh, cranial segments to the caudal segments uh, by the portal uh, level and uh, the anatomic division in left to right uh, by the falciform uh, ligament with a teres ligament and uh, the sections of the segments by the three veins. But of course we know that uh, the individual anatomy may vary and that means that uh, surgical planning needs of course a detailed individual analysis. Then uh, very important is the triad with uh, the always inclusion of the, the artery, the bile duct, and uh, the portal vein. Uh, going to the surgical uh, division, then uh, we have um, to the left the segments 4A, the upper four part, and the lower 4B. Covered by all these segments is segment one, which is the corded lobe. Um, in cross-sectional imaging, we refer uh, to these three levels, which help us to uh, estimate uh, the, the precise site of a lesion as, um, as precise as possible, because often the lesions are uh, in the, at the border between the segments and to say strictly it is this or that segment uh, is not often possible. So the level A uh, provides us uh, the upper segments from the left to the right, segment two, four A, uh, eight and seven divided by the left, middle and right liver vein. Here we see in the Excel, uh, in the Excel uh, image the vena cava and we see the caudate uh, the coded lobe of the liver. When we uh, proceed uh, to level B, uh, we are exactly at uh, the edge from the upper to the lower segments, from two to three, from 4A to 4B, from uh, eight to five, and from, uh, and from uh, seven uh, to six. 
and again the caudal lobe of the liver, and here the uh, the typical uh, portal uh, branching at this level. And the level C, we go down and see the caudal segment three, four uh, B, uh, five and six, and the gallbladder and the falciform ligament with the teres ligament is a rounded, uh, a rounded uh, structure. Uh, if we would like to estimate which segment this is in a more or less sagittal section in sonography, because sonography has free section, uh, free uh, section design, and so we have, let's say, parasagittal, uh, para, uh, para um, axial uh, images, and sometimes coronal. So this presumably hemangioma of the right uh, liver seen in the sagittal section. Then in a more or less axial oblique section, we see it quite near the capsule. And uh, to be a little bit more precise, it's useful, uh, it's useful uh, to uh, follow the liver veins. We have here the right liver vein, middle, um, and here somewhat the branching um, to the left. And here the seventh segment, here the eight, and this uh, from level A. And here we can see that we are exactly at the border of six and seven, or let's avoid the term uh, exactly. So we estimate the most lesions to be in the region of several segments uh, because the fine branching uh, is sometimes difficult to obtain even in CT imaging. In this section, we, are, uh, we have the same, so this is uh, this is uh, seven, eight, and the lesion must be in the border to, um, to, four, to four A. But when we go more to the sagittal section, we see here the portal, uh, the portal level, and see that it is as well uh, extending more caudally. Here the gallbladder from the sonographic view, and then finally we are on the border for uh, A. B, five, and eight. So that means at last we give an orientation, we give a first orientation in, uh, in general radiology and more and more 3D imaging and interdisciplinary settings uh, help the surgeons to, to do their fascinating work. Sometimes we don't need segment analysis, like in this cystic liver transformation of a, um, of a middle-aged man who suffers from pain for uh, many years and, uh, and uh, a really a, a good evaluation of the patient for many years showed that cysts may be the problem. And um, here I would like to, uh, to give a, a advice to use practical anatomy by sonopalpation, because here really very precise by palpating the cysts of the left lobe, it was uh, positive to, um, to show symptoms. It depends, of course, of the patient, if sonopalpation. Should we turn down the light? It's, it's very bright on the uh, picture. I, I would try. Then it's, then it's lower I don't know if. Yes, you are right. We, we should. I first I to I have to. This is really. Yeah. Uh, here is a plus and a minus. Maybe it's the climate that you will freeze in some minutes. <laughs> I do not know. But this is really bad. If we would have a letter, we could give something up there, but <laughs> I'm not allowed to destroy that light. It's the the huh? The is coming. Okay. Yes. 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 It's awful. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Okay, but I think we, sh we have to move on. <laughs> this is a normal section. You see a lot of sonograms um, 
I like to show sonograms because they are free anatomy, they are practical anatomy, and uh, I think that radiologists should keep that method strictly uh, in their repertoire, even combined with MRI and CT parallel. So I will show you a lot, but of course not only sonograms. This is a 45 uh, ma year male with a routine uh, sonography in chronic fatigue. And what we see here, is that visible? Do you have any idea what, what here uh, from the measurements of the liver anatomy is abnormal? Uh, you don't need uh, huh? Sorry? Yeah. So we, we uh, already had a precise analysis, and this is a very important sign. You see it quite often. We see that the liver veins are dilated. I do not like measurements in that. You have to get feeling for that, and it is more difficult in young patients to detect. And there is another sign anatomically which helps you. The vena cava usually is flat and shows a lot of volume changes during investigation. And in this patient, the cava remained uh, at a dilated status for uh, all of the investigation, which is so very important as well to have a look at the vessels. Uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, um, the chest X-ray showed a mildly dilated heart, and uh, this was uh, cardiomyopathy in an early, quite stage. Yeah, now I have a last glimpse on the CP. It's much more beautiful like this. So, finally, uh, there are countless liver variants I will not list up to you, but of course all of us have to be aware of the very common real lobe, uh, genesis, left, right, ectopic accessory tissue, subdiaphragmatic position, and accessory, uh, accessory salsi uh, of the liver surface. Uh, let us start with this young lady and the very common, uh, a, a very common appearance, I think, all of you uh, have seen uh, this type of image, and uh, you see that the liver extends lower than the lower pole of the right kidney, and that should not be the case. So it's the question if it's enlarged or not. And uh, going uh, in, the axial, uh, in the axial level, we see that uh, the peritoneal surface of the liver, and we see here the surface to the abdominal wall, that this liver is very flat. And this is classical for young ladies presenting with a real lobe. And by differentiation uh, of enlargement and diffuse liver disease, other criteria have to help. Here we have the same uh, in the coronal CT, a typical renal lobe. And in CT, it's much more easy because of the overview to estimate that we do not have enlargement, but we have a variant of size and extension of uh, the right liver lobe. Here, it's the other way around. Uh, sometimes we uh, have a renal lobe, but that doesn't mean that it is a healthy liver. And here we have it in the a diffusely hyper uh, echogenic uh, pattern of a fatty of a fatty liver here with parapelvin nixists uh, and this of course is diffuse liver disease and uh, this also proven by non steatotic uh, polygonal uh, areas so uh, another common uh, problem of uh, topographic analysis could be the question if we have really the, uh, the right view of the patient, and this commonly refers to this situation. I think all of you know, but uh, we should not forget that uh, not only the liver on the wrong side uh, is something interested, as well the spleen and all the vessels uh, we have in such a setting. So this is a classical uh, situs inversus, and we see here uh, a lot of spleens because from the spleen development, in these cases, often there is not a complete fusion, and we have more accessory, uh, not accessory, but uh, divided uh, polysplenic 
uh, polysplenic settings in these patients. Uh, in these uh, situs uh, inverses as well, we have an acicos uh, continuation because the fusion of the liver wanes to the cava. Um, if the liver is on the left side, can be difficult, and then they drain usually directly into the right atrium, and then we find this fat acicos uh, in, the, in the thoracic view, and these vessel uh, anomalies uh, sometimes are uh, the leading feature in conventional imaging or, or other accidental approaches to detect them. Not uh, many of them present firstly with symptoms. Here we have um, abdominal pain after ERCP. The more, uh, the more um, elder generation is very, is very uh, trained in analysis of this kind of images. Um, let's have a look at the more, uh, I don't know why this red arrow, it's not my friend, um, and nobody taught me to avoid him. Uh, do you know how to? Uh, my friend is the green one. No, this is the green one. Yeah? But I see additionally a red one. Yeah? Yeah, I can see it also. But here's no red one. So we like him. No, it's not, it's not from me, I know. It's an artificial red one. <laughs> but we like him. He's our friend now, and it's no problem. <laughs> to some extent. Um, Yes, <laughs> what we can see here are bowel loops, some meteoristic uh, filling, but no dilation. And here we have lucencies. I think all of you agree to what? Yes, it's, um, it seems to be perforation. And uh, what we can see here, this is a very interesting anatomical view of a situs inversus after liver transplantation. You see the portal vein, here you see the free air, and this beautiful outline of the psoas uh, uh, by, the, by, the blue, uh, by the blue arrows, it here irregular uh, gas accumulations in the retroperitoneum and as well uh, in the mesentery. Of course, we like in the CT to see the free air in the, in the lung window, beautifully, beautifully displayed here in the coronal section, and here's some gas in the bowel. So let's move on to um, the gallbladder and biliary tree. Uh, I will not focus too much on the interventional anatomy of the biliary tree, but of course, um, we have uh, here a misspelling uh, of the left and the right. This is the left and this is the right. Here the common hepatic duct, the cystic duct, the gallbladder, the common hepatobiliary tract. And this crosses behind the antrum and in different, uh, in different conditions traverses through the pancreatic head or can be freely uh, down uh, to the papilla. And here, the duodenum. Uh, again, here, we see uh, the triad with the bile duct, then the artery, and the portal vein, and the gallbladder. And here, this, uh, the, this uh, drawing with the pancreas, pancreas and uh, here, the, the region just near the papilla. You will see that in more detail at another stage. Here the MRCP of that image with the common bile duct, here the gallbladder, and here the gastric fundus with fluid, and uh, the Virsungianus duct. What are the variants we may meet? The gallbladder is a very practical anatomic organ. Sometimes it is difficult to see in sonography which is the method of choice to detect gallstones. Uh, and we and uh, variants sometimes are helpful uh, to uh, consider not to miss gallbladder disease. <coughs> the uh, variants include a genesis, accessory gallbladder, duplication, triplication, 
uh, Phrygian cap and septum. The first four I mentioned are very rare and can be found, but let's concentrate on practical issues. The Phrygian cap is a very easy thing in computer tomography. You see it as a little fold and somewhat additional cap uh, of the fundus, but can be a hideout for stones so that you see a normal appearance of the gallbladder and near the gas or artifacts in sonography uh, could be somewhat tricky but it is um, a healthy condition and just a variant and no matter of care. Another hideout for stones is the very long gallbladder. You don't see that too often, but you see this torturous gallbladder. Um, and if you would stop imaging here, possibly you could miss stones. So uh, the, the uh, configuration of the gallbladder is anatomically of interest. Then we may have a septum in the gallbladder, and this uh, should not um, this should not be mixed up with disease, and often is combined with a fold. So this septum you can see in sonography not that often, but may occur. And uh, another very important thing is the thickness of um, the gallbladder wall. Here we have the normal thickness uh, lesser than four millimeters. A big fat stone presumably is not currently affecting this gallbladder. Let's have um, another view. This is the complete normal wall of the gallbladder, thin and smooth, and usually uh, uh, better evaluated near the scan head. And here, beautifully, a line of uh, stones is visible. And I recommend in patients where the question to detect, uh, uh, to detect uh, gallstones or, um, uh, or bile disease, uh, I recommend uh, to uh, see the patient not only by turning uh, in the horizontal position, as well to look at the patient standing if the investigation was ne negative. Sometimes you see stones only in the erect position. Very important, the thickness of the gallbladder wall. Here we uh, see a very thick gallbladder wall. It's almost about one centimeter, a big fat stone, and this is the classical appearance of cholecystitis. Then not only the thickness of the wall is interesting, we have to, sh to look at the um, uh, at, the at the homogeneity of the wall, and here this is an inhomogeneous wall, and as well, the adjacent liver is hypoechoic affected, and this was a necroticizing uh, cholecystitis. Not only the thickness of the wall uh, and uh, the structure of the wall, also the content of the gallbladder is of utmost importance. Here we have a stone and here we have echogenic little particles within the gallbladder referring for sludge and stone, but we have to care uh, not to overlook uh, other structures like uh, tumors of the gallbladder. Another criteria of the gallbladder which is of utmost important is the width of the gallbladder which should not exceed uh, four centimeters and if nothing else is to see than a little stone and a nice gallbladder, then we could overlook an enlarged gallbladder. And here the diameter is five centimeter. And uh, by further analysis, we could see the, uh, the diagnosis. We could uh, detect the stone in the area of the cystic duct. The cystic duct is not uh, uh, it's not possible to visualize directly because usually uh, because of his spiral inner layout is so small and not filled by visible fluid. But here the stone exactly at the end of the infantibulum is beautiful visualized and a high drops uh, can be detected. And this is the classical mechanism. The pathoanatomy shows the dilation by a ventile so that the gallbladder can enter, uh, uh, that the bile can enter the gallbladder but cannot uh, 
but cannot live anymore. So let's go to the bilateral tree. Uh, there are variants of drainage which are very important for interventional uh, radiology and surgical planning. And the right posterior duct uh, can drain into the left uh, hepatic duct. The, can as well drain in the right anterior duct. We can have a triple confluence so that the ducts um, go directly in the common hepatic duct. And we can have accessory ducts as well. Let's have a look on this uh, situation. On the right side, I think it's easy for you. There is the liver, and here we have a, a huge tumor. This is also on the coronal MRI imaging, where you can see here a very interesting situation. Is there a suggestion from the audience what well, that could be? Ah, yes, a pancreatic tumor. Um, it was not quite sure then oh, 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 coming from the pancreas or the papilla, but the, the variant condition here on the hilum, it's somewhat interesting. Here's one bile duct, the other bile duct, which is somewhat rare, a double common bile duct combined with a pancreatic tumor. I think it's important uh, to uh, have seen that once, but I don't think that it is too common. Let's have um, a look on the de 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 uh, developmental anomalies, the collateral cyst. The type 1A uh, is seen in 90% and represents 5% of cholestasis in children. And uh, we can have more involvement towards the uh, central uh, liver, and uh, we have as well uh, type B, where it looks like a gallbladder, or like a diverticulum, or uh, a dilation at the level of the papilla. If this involvement uh, grossly involves the liver, it is known to you as the Carolis disease, uh, which, uh, which predisposes, of course, to complications of inflammation uh, later on. Here is an example of MRCP with a collateral cyst type 2. And here the gallbladder collapsed. And the drawing shows you um, in a way how that uh, anatomy uh, of this condition type 2 collateral cyst. Let's go further to, uh, to the pancreas uh, anatomy. The pancreas anatomy uh, provides us with a very difficult uh, surrounding of uh, structures like the stomach, uh, the duodenum. Uh, we have a pancreatic head, the uncinate process, and the leading vessels are the superior mesenteric vein and the confluence, the, um, then the splenic vein, here the mesenteric artery, the aorta, and the vena cava. Again, I would like to invite you to share that with me on sonography. In the practical setting, we see the stomach in a closed relation. We have to press the stomach uh, to, um, to bring the gas upward or downward. And sometimes at the end of the investigation of sonography, pancreas is visualized better. Here we have the pancreatic head, the neck, the corpus, and the tail. You will see uh, on other planes. There is the splenic vein, there is the supermesenteric vein and the confluence, and the super superior mesenteric artery is a rounded, uh, a rounded hyper structure. Here we see the aorta and the vena cava. This is a few where, with a uh, fluid filled duodenum, head, corpus, tail, mesenteric artery. Here the tail more laterally. We, it is difficult to, uh, to see the tail in sonography, but sometimes even we can see the most lateral part uh, could be as well uh, seen through the spleen as a sonographic window. The sagittal section of the pancreas is very important to follow uh, the uh, dilated bile duct 
or uh, to have such uh, a second level to, uh, to detect lesions. Here the sagittal aspect of the superior mesenteric artery, the aorta, and the corpus in a sagittal slightly ob oblique section. Uh, the stomach, the corpus of the pancreas, and the liver in a very, uh, in a very uh, closed relation to each other. The pancreatic development is worthwhile to think about it because from the development we start with a ventral pancreas, a dorsal uh, pancreas, and by rotation uh, the ventral part uh, goes caudally of the dorsal part and uh, then uh, in 55 percent of cases uh, joins the common bile duct on the papilla. And uh, in 40 percent of cases a small accessory duct, the Santorini duct, remains, and in 5% of cases, uh, this is leading to a pancreas derisum, which means that this duct uh, goes freely into the, into the papilla, in the minor papilla. And here we see just a, a small duct joining the uh, common bile duct at the level of the papilla fatari. And this in the MRCP, can be seen this 5% version crossing here the, uh, the common bile duct, and the other duct is not seen in this, but in this other case, we see both ducts, the small duct together with the common bile duct, and here the Santorini uh, duct on the minor papilla. This must be a partial division because there should be, uh, there should be connection with these both ducts as well. So we have variants of the variants and this is like always in anatomy. This is a rare aspect. Only one of 20,000 uh, in the population presents with annular pancreas can be found uh, can be found asymptomatic as in this case and is a rotation anomaly during development. Uh, presents with a duodenal stenosis in newborns and then you know the double bubble sign, this is pediatric radiology and the partial annular pancreas can be symptomatic in adults by complication of inflammation <coughs> or um, fibrotic stenosis, other problems and this one is displayed uh, in a CT enterocolysis, you see here the catheter. It's not always so clear and easy to see. Here we have a, a annular pancreas in the axial uh, section. The duodenal crossing is not that good, but uh, on the sagittal section, easily we see the two parts, the ventral and dorsal part of the pancreas, and that there is a very small uh, pathway for the descending duodenum, but in this case, this was an asymptomatic uh, annulare as well. What we have here is something sad and classical for you, the anatomic relation um, of a pancreatic tumor to the dilated bile duct, gallbladder, here the peritoneal surface of the liver exposed to this uh, center, let's say, of the abdomen where so many things come together. Uh, sonography which is so important for general radiology is at the end when in this difficult region we see uh, lesions where we might suggest a diagnosis but uh, if sonography initially has lesions in the pancreatic head even if it looks like a cyst immediately we go to further imaging sometimes directly into the MRI where we see beautifully here the cyst but multiple cyst uh, along the pancreatic tail shown here is uh, a classical intraductal papillary mucinous neoplasm which is detected much more often nowadays than it was uh, before extensive research has published uh, on the guidelines how to treat. This one can be watched uh, and is in, a, uh, is in a follow up at our institution. The pancreatic relations to the retroperitoneum are crucial for the spread of pancreatitis 
and um, other infilt infiltrations. And what is so very important that the retroperitoneal uh, position of the pancreas has pathways, and um, you see here in a percentage how often the different pathways are involved and the relation of the pancreas dosally to the perirenal space and here in the, par, uh, the, the, ant, uh, the anterior uh, space, uh, including here the descending colon and the ascending colon. And everybody of you who was diagnosing uh, pancreatitis in the necrotizing form has, uh, has uh, seen the pathways of the fluids along these roads. Uh, conventional radiology is still sometimes uh, that what we have to analyze, and in this uh, case of a conventional image, we see uh, rounded structure and only the no structures, calcifications, sometimes punctuate, and uh, if you know the position, the topographic position of the pancreas, it's easy for you to uh, analyze that this is due to chronic pancreatitis and should not be mixed up with vessels or larger calcifications, should not be mixed up with aneurysms of the abdominal vessels. Let's move on to the spleen. The spleen um, is a flat organ measuring 12 centimeters, craniocaudal, sagittal 7 centimeters, and a width of 4 centimeters. Uh, the anatomy shows that it's wedge-shaped, it's protected mainly by the ninth uh, up to the eleventh rib, and has an upper and a lower pole, a diaphragmatic and visceral surface, and is bounded with ligaments um, to the partners, the gastrosplenic ligament and the splenorenal ligaments. The spleen has an arterial uh, enhancement uh, we should not mix up with, uh, that with disease. In a garland-like uh, kind of uh, different types of straining of the pulp, and after one minute, usually we have the beautiful homogeneous aspect of the spleen. The accessory spleen is very common and seen in 10% of the population, and here you see the accessory uh, locations the hilum, tail of the pancreas, omentum, splenic artery, splenocolic ligament, and mesentery. What we have here is an asymptomatic lesion in the pancreatic tail, and this by scintigraphy shows to be an ectopic spleen. It is in the pancreas, uh, and uh, here in the arterial phase has the same, has the same enhancement than the spleen. Of course, in MRI and in all the sequences, it looks like the spleen, but diagnostic is the red blood cell count with technetium 99. The splenosis is something different. Here we don't have accessory spleens. Here we have seeding of spleen tissue after trauma or surgery. This is called splenosis by definition, peritoneal autoimplantation of splenic tissue. Another example of splenosis in the, in the left upper abdomen with rounded splenic uh, parts, sometimes fused, sometimes standing alone. This is very important, a differential diagnosis to tumors. Focal lesions of the spleen um, are, of course, benign calcifications, hemangioma, cysts, can be infarctions as well, and malignant usually presenting with metastasis like in this case, but rare uh, tumors like angiosarcoma, hemangioendothelioma may also occur. But it's very important not to mix up that with, let's say, some atypical arterial phases or something like that. So now in the end, I would like to lead you to a small quiz. We have here a 70-year-old patient. This is the anatomy of the palarus and of the duodenum. There is some tissue changes in the stomach. And here we have um, a kind of duodenal compression. 
Then we go to sonography, you know, I like that, and we found that this patient was icteric, we knew that, intrahepatic cholangiectasy, the double channel, and then here on the liver we saw this kind of lesion, 9.8 centimeter, and is adjacent to the peritoneal surface of the liver, and here we have all of them. Here we have the vessels, we have the pancreas, uh, we have the stomach, and so my question, what would you think if you see this? 9.8 centimeter echogenic part and a round, uh, loosened, uh, hypoechoic part. Do you have any suggestion? I heard something like that. We put the cola Doppler into, so there so should be some vessel involvement. And this man was healthy, it was a sporty guy, just yellow, and uh, we did a sonography before the planned CT. And then we did the CT immediately and could see this huge lesion and filled with uh, blood or contrast material and blood. What do you think that is? Yeah. Let's see the anatomy of this lesion here in the angiography. Directly, uh, we, we see the blood coming from the, from the start of the hepatic artery. Here it is splenic artery. Let's move on a little bit further on. And then here we have the super, uh, superior mesenteric artery and here the arcades. And from the other side, the lesion is filled as well. And here we remember the sonographic appearance, which was this part. And this is a pseudoaneurysm of the hepatic artery with 9.8 centimeter. It was a very difficult course for the patient, postoperative bleeding, but after one week, it was okay after the operation. It is 1 uh, uh, 0.1 to 2% prevalence. Uh, in the visceral arteries, and as you know, the splenic aneurysms are the most common, hepatic aneurysm 20%, and others 1 to 5%, degenerative, atherosclerotic, and iatrogen. If there are more than 20 centimeters or threefold dilation of the originating vessels, then operation should be considered, but this is always a very difficult interdisciplinary task. So uh, I hope that uh, that could give you an overview by images. I want to just give you a summary. Clinical words, work needs awareness of anatomy and anatomic variants. Computer topography shows detail and displays topographic context. MR, of course, the tissue characteristics in a bad way, but sonography builds anatomy by hands, skills of the investigator, and allows dynamic visualization, sonopalpation, and complementary information to see and MRI. I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Pekuser, uh, for the nice presentation and the excellent images. You made anatomy fascinating. Thank you very much.